morning, we'll be in, in this room. And Father, you teach us all things by the power of the Holy Spirit. That gives us the education of standing your word. He enables us to carry on what we have learned, what you have taught us, Father God, into a world uh, that's still full of darkness that needs the light of a good godly character to be manifested. We pray this in your name, Father God, because we know without you we are nothing, literally nothing. You are everything, our sum total of existence, and all we accomplish is found in you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Uh, well, this, this theme uh, this year uh, is... Uh, Legacy, um, how would we be remembered? And uh, there are a lot of taglines that come along with that. Scott shared one this morning that he could, you know, uh, uh, leaving a uh, legacy is by leaving it with action. Well, I have one for you. As you see, you're filling. There's a couple of blank spaces that you're going to be able to fill in some the things that we talked about this morning. And, and uh, for me, leaving a, uh, leaving a legacy, uh, we must, uh, in order to leave one, we must live one. Yeah. We must live one. Uh, Joseph really helps us uh, to learn how to do that when you look and study uh, his life. Uh, I think there's a lot of things, a lot of ways in which we get to relate to Joseph, you know, uh, in our own personal life. The highs and the lows that Joseph himself faced, the types of temptations and battles and struggles that he faced in life because, you know, God gave him a word, you know, very young in his age. As a young boy, he gave him a word uh, in his life, and it was that word that carried him, you know, um, that he stayed with, that fashioned him, fashioned him as a person, as an adolescent, as a young man, and ultimately as a man, uh, you know, with the character of God. And uh, there's something to be said about that. That's, that's, that's a little bit of a, of a off track here, a little bit, but there's something to be said about that. that worth, uh, again, pausing with in our own lives. Scott touched on a little bit uh, this morning about the power of the Word, you know, and how vital it is in our life. And, you know, when you look at the life of Joseph in Genesis chapter 39, uh, you, you come to see that it was that Word given as a boy that carried him all through his life. And, uh, there, again, something worth being said in, in the Word that God gives us, whether it is a you know, spoken Word into our spirit, you know, or it's that word that is given to us we call the Bible. Um, there, is, there, is, there is, again, a wonderful mystery in all of that. It's something that we should not take lightly in our lives. If we're going to live as godly men with godly character in our society. The story of Joseph, as, as, as recorded by Jamie in his book, and can I endorse that book for you? Anybody here get it yet? Anybody read it yet? If you ain't got it, you ain't read it yet, right? Uh, so, I will encourage you to get the book, particularly at this price. Um, it is just a, a great, simple read. Simple in the sense that, you know, it's, it's, it's not fancy. Uh, it, and it really addresses, you know, the uh, uh, thing I like about it is the variety in which uh, Jamie addresses, you know, and they're, and they're all issues that we as men uh, will encounter. And um, where he speaks of the life of Joseph, you know, was in the area of sexual issues and uh, all of that in life. But for me today, I want to get a little bit broader than that. Uh, I want to touch on the things that kept, you know, Joseph, you know, on that path of being a godly man in, a, in, a, in an ungodly um, culture. And, uh, and I think the Lord has given a, a verse and some insight uh, that we can walk away with. That at least, you know, I can apply this whether I'm struggling you know, with anger, or I'm struggling in a relationship, or I am struggling with, you know, sexual issues, or, you know, thoughts in my mind, or, you know, just, I, you know, there's an answer that God gives us in, in this passage of Scripture that helps us to deal with life in general. And I, I want to stretch that out uh, this morning uh, as we talk today. And, you know, and you can walk away and say, you know, I can apply this to my battle, or I can apply this in just how I can live. Because I think, yeah, here, when we talk about good intentions, I think it's all our intentions to live for God, you know, and, and to be a light in this, in this world. And it, and, and it becomes challenging. It gets worse and worse, you know, as we get older and older. Um, not just because of our age, just because of what our society is allowing to accept and endorse. And, uh, you know, those, that culture constantly is changing. Uh, but, but our life as the Word of God 
you know, who guides us should not change. Should not change. And how do we balance that without being, you know, religious nerds in essence, you know, and, and haters? But how do we reflect that consistent character of God as His Word is interpreted in our lives? And, and that's what you know I, I really want to talk about uh, in giving us three insights and three steps that I think God offers us to make that happen. So. You know, it, you know, the question is, it's, it's a great question, is how will we be remembered? And, uh, you know, I wish that I was constantly challenged by that when I was young. I'm 56 years old now, three kids and three granddaughters. And, uh, you know, <coughs> this meant something to me when I was an adolescent, and when I was in my 20s, and I was in my 30s. You know, I, I was carefree more so at that point. You know, uh, leaving a legacy or how will I be remembered wasn't a big deal. You know, I just, I want to get on to the next video game or, you know, something of that nature be part of the next sporting event or something. It wasn't about, you know, uh, character was not something that was high on my priority. I cared about what people saw of me or thought of me. That mattered. I think that always matters with us. But it was always from the wrong perspective. Had the wrong value attached uh, to, the wrong, to the wrong intention. And um, so now that I'm 56, that, that really becomes important to me. You know, when I look at my grandkids, you know, that, that I want them to remember uh, a poppy as uh, one who was a man of God, you know, one who, you know, you know, stood for something. You know, I want them to be able to remember that when they're living in a world that's much crazier than the world I'm living in, they've got a resource to go back to and draw from and say, this one thing always kept poppy, and that was his love for God, you know, his devotion to the Father. You know, that, 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 that always kept in, in a crazy, crazy world because they're being raised in a Christian home. Their parents are, 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 are on staff with me uh, at our church. And so, you know, they're being raised in a Christian environment. I, I, I'm confident they'll always be raised in a Christian environment. But I always, you know, there are moments, even when we're raised in a Christian environment, that we're out there all by ourselves, that we need some sort of something that God can bring as a standard to raise against when the enemy comes on that blood. And so, you know, that, that becomes more important to me. And I only say that because I know that there are guys that are younger than I am here. And, and I would challenge you to make this something of importance in your life. You know, it does tie itself into, you know, our, our intentions and our devotion to God. But it, it's worth uh, remembering and taking it up a notch, you know, to the fact that, you know what, I want, this is how I want to be remembered. This is the type of legacy that I want to leave. And I want to believe that I've got to live. I've got to live this legacy out. It's not something that I, you know, whether we hear about it or not at our funeral, I don't know. You know, I'm not uh, that theologically deep uh, in that area. But uh, the fact of the matter is, I just want people to talk about uh, me, uh, you know, then. Uh, you know, I want them to begin to see it now, you know, in that, res in that, in that respect. So uh, today there are a lot of great resources out there for you. Highly recommend you to pick up um, James' book as one of those to do that. That's a real privilege for me to take some time uh, to do this. So we're going to talk about living with character in an ungodly world. And, our focus is on the life of Joseph, which is one of the chapters of James' book, Genesis chapter uh, 39. And uh, we're going to uh, just talk about uh, some of the things uh, in that situation they found with Potiphar's wife. Uh, again, it's a whole environment, a whole uh, setting that was created that he didn't ask for, but he was placed in. You know, he was just doing what uh, you know, he was called to do, not only by Potiphar, but also uh, by God himself. And uh, again, in this circle of, of Christianity, this is a well-known story for us, the story of Joseph. I'm impressed, you know, a lot of times, even in our secular world, uh, how a lot of the biblical stories are, are remember David and Goliath, you know, is, is something that all, you know, most people know about. You hear it in sports venues and David and Goliath's story, and they kind of get the concept. Well, this is another one of those stories that the secular world gets, gets its concept in, in a way. They know about the story of Joseph, and uh, a lot of times they'll quote things uh, from the story that they don't even realize from uh, what source it came from. And, 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 and one of those great lines is that, you know, uh, what's meant for evil turns out to be good. Now, they may use it in different vernacular or whatever, you know, in different words, but they, they, they get the essence of it. That's why, you know, our, I mean, our world thinks it's so smart, but really, you know, if it wasn't for God, there's really nothing new under the sun. You know, we just, uh, we just uh, borrow from him, we just don't give him the credit. Uh, that he is due, but it's there. So again, I have to say that, that you know, if you encourage your heart, that as you're dealing 
you know, with the world, and you're talking to your coworkers, and you are in those environments that you know are are worldly and secular, and, and a lot of that conversation is not uplifting and edifying. And you're there as salt and light, you, and you feel that responsibility. You know, there, you know, our world knows more than we give it credit for at times. You know, and sometimes that that works against us, and, that, and that's just not it's just not healthy in our relationship to them and, how, and what we're called, you know, to be. And that is salt and light, ministers of reconciliation. And, you know, when we walk in with um, a holier-than-thou attitude or you don't know what I know and you need to know what I know, uh, it, it builds walls and it's, as opposed to tearing them down. So, you know, uh, a great statistic, and I'm going down a rabbit trail here, guys, for a minute, uh, but a great statistic is that 80% of the people that you know will accept an invitation to church. You know, or, and uh, that, that, and seventy percent of the people that you know, uh, you know, um, are interested in Christ in uh, a better way. And so um, the percentages are, are large and huge, and it's there. The the, the field has always been right, you know, uh, and it's just how we approach that field. And so we do what it tells us. We pray, and when we pray, God helps us. Amen. 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 God helps us. So let's get on with the story. Well, we know the backdrop a little bit. Joseph was given a dream. You know, as a young boy, and it's that dream that fashioned him, uh, you know, into the, into the person that he, he, he was becoming. You know, he found great favor with uh, Potiphar, uh, uh, a leader in Egypt, uh, in the government that was there, uh, so much that he brought him into his home, you know, made him a place to stay, uh, called favor with him. Um, and part of that is, I believe that, you know, it was because of, of, of Joseph's attitude. You know, it's summed up in this statement when uh, Potiphar's uh, wife, you know, did everything she could to seduce this guy. You know, and again, let me remind you that this wasn't a one-time attempt. You know, she came at him, guys. You know, and uh, she did. She was relentless. You know, and she was not um, uh, ugly. <laughs> you know, when you do the research, she was an, an extremely attractive, uh, voluptuous woman. You know, and. Um, Again, I paint a picture because I think we can all relate to the struggles that we have there. And, and Joseph repeatedly, you know, um, uh, turned her down. And the very thing in his good intention as he was uh, running away from her, and, you know, she got a hold of his coat. And it was that coat that was evidence for her, you know, uh, in regards to getting him thrown into prison. And, and again, I only stopped to pause on that a little bit to say, is that, you know what, you know, when, even when you do the right thing, sometimes bad things happen. You know, and when and when you what you gotta get down to is that you know even when the bad things happen, God's still with me. You know, and, and so I'm gonna trust Him. And it was a miserable life for Joseph at that at, uh, in those years that he was in prison. He, and, and even from his childhood, he never wanted the things that came his way that did come his way. But because he trusted God, and how did he trust God? He trusted God through the dream that was given to him, the word that was instilled in him. He always had a faith and a trust in God. He had a great devotion to God, a great devotion. And when, and when so, you know, when he's running away and, and, and there's temptations before him, he's saying, you know, and I use my words, God forbid that I should sit against God. And that just opens up a whole uh, understanding of where Joseph's heart was and what his devotion was to. You know, God forbid, you know, here's this temptation that is, you know, I didn't have to go searching for it. It came to me. You see what I'm saying? So whatever that temptation is, you know, our heart should uh, uh, come alongside of Joseph's and say, God forbid that this should be an offense to my father. You know, and, and that be a thought that should be there. And I, I believe, friends, that it, you know, as you leave this place, because the word of God never returns void, the Holy Spirit's going to help you with that. You know, that's going to be something he's going to send up, whether it be a neon lights, a red flag, or something, or whatever. And when that temptation, whatever it is, when, when that thing's calling you back to where it wants to take you, you're going to remember the words of Joseph, God forbid. And that's going to be a pause for you to take some action. And, and, and enough strength and resource to say, you know what, you know, i got new juice now. I, I can go a different direction. I don't have to fall in that temptation any longer. Because the Bible makes it very clear, temptation is always going to be for us. It's always going to be there. And it's not a sin to, to be tempted. It's a sin when we step into that temptation. And, and Joseph was able to separate that, he said, because of his devotion for God. Not Joseph's natural desires. I mean, again, like I said, we can all put ourselves there. But his devotion to God meant more 
to him than his, than his own personal satisfaction. And, you know, and whatever that temptation could do for him. Because sometimes we, 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 we are seduced into those temptations because our mind is working, you know, this temptation has a way to better me, to better me, to advance me in some capacity, to again fulfill a desire that is in my heart, but maybe not necessarily what God wants in my life at any level. And so, you know, it, it's very easy when, you know, God helps us by narrowing it down, love us thou need more than these. You see? And if we can remember those words, those simple passages in our mind, then, you know, when temptation comes, we're going to have a means, a, a time to pause, and a time to say, you know what, God, I do love you more than these. This relationship we are in has greater value than this temptation that's presented itself to me right now. And so there's, you know, you know we can call it devotion, but at times there is, you know, uh, more uh, uh, than, than just devotion. I, I, I sometimes just call it, and this is one of your first or second uh, fill -ins. I call it stick to itiveness. Now, believe it or not, that's a word. That's a word. A stick to itiveness. Uh, you know, and, and that word stick to itiveness has uh, these kinds of uh, synonyms that go along with it. Uh, it's an endurance, it's a durability. Stick to itiveness. It's a stamina. There's a staying power. There's a John Wayne component to it. You know, the old dude. How many know John Wayne? Mm. Yeah, I'm in that stage. That whole generation. John who? John who? Some point of my, my reference is, but the Duke, you know, he just, well, you know, he's just a character that had grit. I love that true grit. You know, he had guts about him, you know, uh, at least as it was portrayed by him in his character. But here's my favorite. Here's my favorite definition of stick to it. This is a sturdiness over time. Sturdiness over time. Like I said, we can amen, amen, and hallelujah. That, that word sectitudinous and devotion and all that right here in this environment. But when we get out into the world, uh, we need a sturdiness. You see, this is something we've got to allow to grow over time. And each and every victory that we have strengthens our sticktoidness for the next temptation. Because the next temptation is coming. And the next temptation that's coming is not going to be as easy as this temptation we just conquered. Because Satan already recognizes that, you know what, I can't hit him with this anymore. So I've got, to, I've got to up the ante. And so he comes at us even harder in whatever weakness we find within ourselves. But again, as Joseph, when that temptation comes, God forbid that I should offend my father. You know, God forbid that I should stay. I'm going to demonstrate <coughs> to I'm going to continue to grow over time. I'm going to become sturdy over time. And, and that's going to happen with each and every time that the, that the power of God's Spirit and the remembrance of His Word that manifests itself in my life, I choose that way. I choose the narrow way. I choose this day to serve the Lord. You see? And that builds that sturdiness in our life. And again, it's something that happens over time. It's not something that is a flash pan just today we're all pumped and encouraged and we leave and you know, we're shouting hallelujah. Um, but these things are here to prepare you for those times that, you know, that temptation comes. So you can live with godly character in an ungodly world. And so this is something that Joseph, all, over all those years, he demonstrated. With all the setbacks, it was a roller coaster for us. Sometimes he was very high, had great favor uh, with his captors. But then there are times he's in the prison, put there by his captors. And so he's up and he's down, and it just demonstrates to us that this is how we journey through this life. It wouldn't matter to us if we weren't born again. See what I'm we wouldn't we wouldn't make these equations. We wouldn't connect those dots. It would be just life as normal. I'm just pressing to get ahead. You know, I'm just trying to live a better life. I'm trying to make better ultimately for myself. You know, I'm trying to. You know, I'm just living the American dream. Sometimes the American dream gets in the way of God's dream for us. You see, and we've got to understand that separation. And Joseph understood. You know, that separation. That this dream God gave is not about. You know, it'll have an effect on this earth, and it'll have an effect in my family, it'll have an effect in wherever I go, but it really is about God's dream, His passion, and His heart. And that's something that we've got to, again, open our eyes to, allow the Holy Spirit to help us and attach ourselves to it. Because that's what gives us that stick to it in this. We see the bigger picture, and not just our immediate need or craving in our own life, whether it is, it is, it is for God or just for the things of this world we're going to talk about. A little bit about that. I think every time Joseph got weary in his devotion to God, he found strength, a new juice 
when he remembered what God spoke to him in a dream as a young boy. And it was just, for me, this goes back to the word of the Lord. I mean, we need those moments and those times of refresher. So, you know, uh, there are many passages that speak to us in living in an ungodly world and how we live with godly character. But the one that the Holy Spirit drew my attention to is on your notes. It's found in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. It says, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. I really like what Scott did a little bit. He helped us to disconnect, you know, or at least to understand, you know, uh, our role or who we are as believers. You know, we all have good intentions, you know, most likely everyone in this room loves God, you know, and, and, and is desirable to serve God. Uh, but we can do godly things, you know, and still deny the power of God within our lives, mm -hmm. you know. And, and so for us, you know, being a Christian is, it, you know, you, we need church, but it's not what makes us a Christian. You know, we need to obey the word of the Lord by bringing our tithe or offering into the storehouse of God. <coughs> That's what we needed, but that's not what defines us as, as, as believers. They are fruits that come from our salvation. You see what I'm saying? And it's not just something that we live on a Sunday, you know, but it's something we carry on through our lives. And what I like about what Scott was saying is that, again, it brings back to reality that, you know, because I see it a lot. And as a pastor, and I have to be challenged in my own life. You know, I, I see a lot of times, you know, we get this idea or this philosophy in our mind that, you know, God, you're a part of our life. See what I'm saying? When God needs to be the sum total of our lives, everything. And because our lives get so busy or distracted in so many ways, you know, we think we're doing God a favor when we go to church on Sunday. See what I'm saying? Like, God's really happy with us because I showed up on a Wednesday night. That's huge. And then if I go to a prayer meeting, <laughs> uh, that's that's really big. That's a lot of rewards that I'm going to get in storing up in heaven. When God's saying, you know, I want your devotion every day. You know, every day. And so you're not just a slice of my life, God. You know, I need to understand that you are my life. I live for you. You know, you're you're not living for me. I live for you. You redeemed me. You bought me back. You know, and man, I am ever grateful for that. You know, and, 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 and again, as we get into this a little more, hopefully that's what we can walk out with. There's a, a huge appreciation for what God's given to us through Jesus Christ. And so it's no longer that I, you know, I feel like I'm in bondage, but Lord, I freely dive into this thing and give you my whole life uh, and surrender it completely to you. Because he's right when in Matthew 6, 33, if we'll see first his kingdom, he will add all these things out. He'll guide our path. And he will put into our lives exactly what is needed and necessary in order for us to fulfill Jeremiah 29, 11, our destiny, our plans that he has for us. God will do that. And he's an awesome father. He's, he's an awesome him. father. You know, he cares about each and every one of us and fulfilling the dreams and the passions that he's poured into our lives. And I'll tell you, if we don't walk with him, we'll never accomplish him. We'll never, we'll never see those fulfillment. And we'll never, ever truly be genuinely happy. And I think that Joseph understood that. I mean, the Bible doesn't make a lot of that, you know, make reference to that a lot. But I just know, and maybe you can identify too, that through my personal journey, the more that I walk with God, the more that I respond to what God is saying, the happier and more confident of a man I am. I am. So that when the unexpected comes, you know, my hair's not, there's not much left of it. But it's not going everywhere, you know what I'm saying? I'm not breathing heavy. You know, my heartbeat's not accelerating. There's a comfort and a peace and a confidence that I found in the Prince of Peace. Amen. And so it's just, I think, that Joseph himself, you know, and again, to me, that's living with godly character in an ungodly world. We are demonstrating. So through, there's three insights we're going to talk about uh, this morning that I think gives us and nurtures uh, our devotion. Uh, so when uh, sin comes knocking, we, like Joseph, can say, you know, it would be a great sin against against God. The first one uh, that this passage of Scripture points out to us that I believe God wants to deliver to you is that don't love the world. Don't love the world. This, this word love is attached to what we understand as a God love, which is an unconditional love. It's 
an unconditional one, which I think, again, is significant. Because, again, growing up in the church and reading this, like Scott himself said, you know, when you read these passages of Scripture, you, you make certain perceptions, you know, or it speaks to you at certain levels, uh, you know, in your spiritual journey. And to me, this love, you know, I can never love God over this world like I love God. That's exactly what it's telling us not to do, but yet I found myself doing just that at times. There was that, again, that equation. Uh, that, that even parallel that you know the world and God my love for both of them were the same this passage of scripture is saying you can't mix the two Amen. it's just it's just not acceptable uh, to God it's impossible to love the world unconditionally and love God unconditionally Jesus said he just can't serve two masters you know that's how he put it you know he's driving that point home again to us to preserve our our character which is ultimately our goal to preserve his character See what I'm saying? So our, when our life is constantly being transformed into His life, we're putting off the old and taking on the new. And that's an ongoing process in our life. And so we are driven, we are driven to the concept of living a godly character. And so we can't do that if we love the world the same way we love God. There's a conflict that's happening there, a natural conflict. And so He's telling us to separate ourselves, identify that, understand that, that you cannot love the world the way that you love God. Someone is going to lose. And in reality, it's not only us, it's the people that we have the opportunity to influence into the kingdom of God. They lose also. But I, I think God has an alternative plan to just bring someone else along. But I don't want someone else to come along in my foot. What I want to be doing, that's what I want to be doing. I don't want to, I don't want God to have a plan B when it comes to my life. I want to be, I want to shoot for that obedience and, and what God's going to do uh, in this life. So to maintain a devotion to God. You cannot love the world. <coughs> you are to love God. To maintain a devotion to God, a stick to itness, you cannot love the world the same way that you love God. Second insight that this passage of scripture gives us and challenges us to protect, protect your eyes. Protect your eyes. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure. A craving for everything. We see. Protect your eyes. Now, what are the eyes? The eyes? Well, they're a soul of the window. And I recognize that it's um, realistically, uh, we cannot prevent everything uh, your eyes gaze upon. It, you know, the cat's out of the bag, our world's on a path that, um, I don't know, sexual issues are becoming more acceptable. Um, you know, it shows that you didn't think at one point. I'm saying, you don't go back to Andy Griffith. <laughs> you don't go back to that either. You're hard-pressed to find something that is not going to catch you off guard. Uh, I don't care how clean you think the show is. Our society today is accepting more and more gross sin. It's just doing it. And so when you thought this was a good show at one time, in order for it to get its ratings, it's got to make its own compromises, and it doesn't care about promoting Christ. And so you have to be conscientious of that stuff. I mean, I, I got three granddaughters, I told you. And my youngest is, is eight, 19 months, and uh, Friday, Monday is, is my day off. And so we spend time together with my wife, and, and uh, one of her favorite shows is Bubble Guppies. He's in the Bubble Guppies. Who even knows what bubble gum is? Right. There's a couple. Bless God. Um, but it's a great show. And it's pretty entertaining even for adults because it's, it, it, you know, it's got some good beats in there. You know, it's, uh, it's got some good storylines in there. You know, it's not that cheesy kind of, uh, you know, uh, cartoon show. Um, so it's really cool. And we're watching it one day. It's talking about matching clothes and how important, you know, the right clothes are the right thing, teaching the kids that, you know, when you see a police officer, this is pretty much what their guard's going to look. When you look to find a firefighter, this is what their guard's going to look like, uh, and so forth and so on. But in the end, they were having, like, this old Rocky theme uh, with um, uh, 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 Molly. Well, you don't know who Molly is, anyway. Um, <laughs> she was in the ring against this, uh, uh, her, her opponent. And it was just matching clothes. Ones, you know, find the ones with zippers. Find the ones with buttons, and so forth and so on. And what it was, the person on the outside, the announcer, was uh, was a, a character of. Uh, um, I always get his name wrong, but I'm 
RuPaul, is it Ru? Yeah. Is it the crossdresser that really came out? Uh, and, 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 and here it is. It made itself in. Subtle as it was, it made itself in. At this level, for my granddaughter. And so I'm, I'm saying that just to illustrate the fact that when you think, you know, so pay attention to what your children, your grandkids are watching. Uh, like I say, public companies do the animation, kids show, well here it was. And then there have been some other things <coughs> that have endorsed things to where our culture is moving, you see? And so, protect <coughs> your eyes. Again, it's, it's unrealistic to say that, you know, you can shelter them from everything because it's, our world is just getting exploded, you know, with, with all sexual and when was the, you know, their rights, uh, sex cells, you know? And so, uh, you know, there'll be a day I'm sure, should the Lord tarry and decide that we need to stay here, that we'll see days that uh, you know, nudity will pop up, you know, uh, it shows that we thought, you know, there should be no, none. So, again, we live in this world, we're here, God hasn't redeemed us yet, He hasn't taken us out of it yet, you know, we're here for purpose, you know, we're here to be light and salt, we live in it, but we got to learn to protect our eyes, that's one of the insights in order for us to have godly character, you know, we've got to protect our eyes, and so, what that tells us is that to maintain a devotion to God, you must build into your life a discipline to reject in your heart what the eye has seen. That's your responsibility as a child of God, a man of God. One who's got a devotion, one who has a stick to it in this. One who says, you know what, I've answered the call. I'm going to live with a godly character in an ungodly world. And so I can't keep the billboards from shining into my windshield. I can't keep, sometimes I'm caught off, completely off surprise, because I'm not watching any Griffin. And, and bam, there it is. It's like, you know, I walk past, you know, co-worker's computer, and bam, there it is. And we all know that, you know, we're all susceptible to sin, whether it's pornography or something else, it's there. And the enemy will use those moments to entice us. And so as God's children, we have an obligation to the Father. I don't want to offend my God. And so I've got to build this discipline into my life. I've got to allow what God gives me, the Holy Spirit, the Word, the body of Christ, my brothers in faith. I've got to build that discipline within me to watch that thing <clears throat> wash out of my life. It doesn't take root. Because it's going to find its way in. It's just, it's just the world we live in. It's only going to get worse. In that respect. So I've got to build it. That's my responsibility to guard this treasure in this earthen vessel. It's my call. And when I do that, it's going to build a godly character in my life. And so I, I have to protect my heart, what my eyes allow in, because I just can't get away from it. Again, I don't go looking for it. I'm just saying it's present. And the more that we, the longer God gives us life on this earth, the more that that is going to explode in our lives. And so, you know, I can you know, it's a, it's a winning or a losing call to say, well, that's, the world's doing it. You know what? We're in this world. We're not of this world. Amen. Greater is he that's in us than he is in this world. Hallelujah. And so God gives us abilities. He gives us power to say, you know what? I reject what this eye is bringing in. Because it's not God. It's not going to establish the character of God in my life. And last of this morning, keep your ego in check. Keep your ego in check. In pride, in our achievements and possessions. As men, we often allow our possessions to identify who we are. To identify who we are. To have something is as important as the reason we have it. What I mean by that is that, you know, these possessions can stroke our ego. Gives us feelings of, of pleasure accolades from others. It helps nurture a prideful position. And so, you know, our possessions, the more that we, toys that we get to have, or, oh, I shared this in the last session, I don't know why I went there, but I'll share it again today. But how about that trophy life? <coughs> you know, that's a possession of ours. The reason that we want that trophy wife is not just because she's beautiful, it's because the guys are talking about it. See, if the guys are talking about it, then guess what? That's elevated my ego. And so now all of a sudden, it's not that you have a love for your wife, it's the fact that you have a love for yourself. 
You hear that? So it's all about you. And they have your issues on the other side. But let's talk about us. And so it's about possessions. It identifies us. When we don't want people to see us. I'm not saying it's wrong to have a beautiful wife. I'm not saying it's wrong to have the ATVs and all those. I'm not saying, don't go there. But what I'm saying is that when it's about those things, and that's my identity, I'm not letting the world see Jesus in me. Amen. See? And that's what I'm about. And that's what I'm about. If I can do that with a, with a crazy golf cart that's plugged out, then man, it's cool. <laughs> you know, if I can do that with a shiny Cadillac, that's fine. But if I can't, God help me. God help me. Because my identity is not in what I drive or, or what I live in or who I'm married to. My identity is in Christ. Amen. Amen. And that's the possession. He has possessed us so that he may possess the world. Because through us, you know, we bring that ministry of reconciliation. And so, protect your ego. You know, keep your ego in check. It's there. It's, it's, it's a natural part of us. Paul said, I have pride, but I have it in Christ. Amen. Say, I have in Christ. So it's, it's not wrong, these things. It's just that these things have been tainted by sin. And they, in itself, our imagination, our pride, our emotions, they all have to be washed through the blood of Jesus Christ and renewed by the word of the Lord. You see? I mean, we surrender that all to Him. All to Him. So protect your ego. Uh, it's one of the ways to maintain a devotion to God. We must be honest enough and humble in heart. To acknowledge from whom all blessings flow. I'll say that to you again. To maintain a devotion to God, we must be honest enough and humble in heart to acknowledge from whom all blessings flow. I'm going to wind down here and let you go. Okay, because one of the common threads can be woven through all of this, or all of the above, or that common phrase, gratitude. Gratitude. <clears throat> a gratitude towards God. Giving of thanks to Him always for the help He sent to us through Jesus Christ, His Son. It's a heart full of gratefulness. Father, I know that I can overcome whatever the temptation is, whatever is brought before me. I know I can overcome it because of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus, before He left this earth, he gave us this encouragement in our own lives. You overcome because I overcome. That gives us hope. Amen? Amen. I'm going to overcome this thing. I may stumble and fall, but it, it may win the moment, but it is not going to win the day. God forbid that I should sit against my Lord. God forbid. Because it's stick to it in this that He's building in us. He's giving us all the words, all the encouragement. And now, guys, all we got to do is carry it out. All we got to do. All we got to do. He will help us. We pray for you all. Well, so, Father, thank you. Thank you for helping us. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Lord, we do not have to be slaves to our temptations. We do not have to fall to those temptations. These temptations do not have to identify who we are. I am grateful through Jamie's book and as well what Scott said this morning. And Lord, as our skin is renewed every, uh, every two weeks, so are we capable of being renewed. It's who you are. You redeem us. You make us new. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, I thank you for that. And God, that when we stumble, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin as we confess that. As we humble ourselves and come to you, O oh Father God, you set us free. I bless you for that, Master. And I thank you. I thank you for my band of brothers. I thank you, Father God, for the victories that they know and they will experience in days to come. I thank you that you walk with them and that you care for them. You're going to be a blessing to them, Father God. And through that blessing, they're going to be a blessing to so many others as they prepare to leave a legacy. Something, Father God, that they are living even this very moment. Bless you, Father God, so that when they are remembered, so will you be. And their life of inspiration will inspire others to choose you. We bless you, Father, for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.